Welcome to the CompTIA A plus 220-1101 or Core 1 exam. This is Objective 2.4, Networking Services. If you ever worked in a data center or if you have an organization that has a data center, then this picture probably looks familiar. It's row after row of all these 19 inch racks and those racks have inside of them many different types of computing systems. In this module, we'll look at many different kinds of network services and see what types of things might be running inside of the company's data center. Almost every organization and every data center has inside of it a DNS server. DNS stands for Domain Name System, and it's a service that's primary, primarily responsible for converting between fully qualified domain names and IP addresses. So if you go into a browser and type www.google.com, that browser will ask a DNS server what's the IP address, and it will report back. And from that point forward, the web browser uses the IP address of any web server to communicate back and forth to your web browser. DNS is distributed naming system, which means that you might have many different DNS servers in your environment. And outside of your organization, you're probably communicating with many other DNS servers as well. As you can probably tell, this conversion process between a fully qualified domain name and an IP address is critical for the entire communications process. It's usually managed by your local IT department or an internet service provider, and they usually have multiple DNS servers to ensure that this service is always available to its users. Another common service that you'll find is a data center and a DHCP server. This stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and this is a service that automatically assigns and configures IP address settings on your local device. This is a service that we've become very accustomed to having, and we can plug in or connect to anyone's network, and we're automatically provided IP addresses, DNS settings, and everything else that we need. If you have a wireless router or a cable modem that's used for internet connectivity, then that device probably is also running a DHCP server inside of it. If you're in an enterprise IT department or some corporate environment, there will probably be multiple DHCP, DHCP servers to provide redundancy. So if one is available, another will be up and using its service. You can see that the least time in different settings of each DHCP server varies. Now that you can connect to the network, you can also store files on the network in a file server. This is a centralized storage device, usually with a set of folders that you can use to store all of your information. And because these are stored on the network, you can log in from any device and have access to your personal files. The operating system you're using has a common way to communicate to this file server. If you're in Windows, you're probably using SMB or a server message block. If you're in Mac OS, you're probably using AFP or the Apple filing protocol. From a user's perspective, they have no idea what's going on in the background. They just see some folders. And when they click on it, it interacts and they can copy, delete, rename them just like any file on their computer locally. If you work in a bigger environment, you probably will need to connect to a lot of printers. It's ideal to put these printers on a server and centralize the area where they connect to administer and maintain it more easily. We're able to connect to the network and a print server, and this is very easy to manage the hardware and software. Anyone can click on it and add the printer. The print server may be software that's running on a computer that has a printer connected to it, and everyone on the network would send their print jobs to this computer. 
so that the print server can then access those jobs and send them to the printer. Many printers might also have a hardware card, like the one you see, like a NIC, and it plugs straight into a network. Some printers also have wireless access points inside of them. You can simply connect to the wireless network and send a print job to it. Another important service that often requires 100% uptime and availability is the mail server. This is the server responsible for sending and receiving mail for your organization. Because the service is so critical, it's often managed by your local IT team, and we may be using an ISP or cloud-based service to provide these mail services. We often know very quickly if there's a problem with the mail service, because practically everyone in the organization is using them. That's why this is usually run and monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it needs to be supported seriously. If the mail server has a problem, you instantly can have someone connecting to that service experience issues. We've already mentioned a number of services like DNS, DHCP, file sharing, printing, but another important service and environment are logs. With all these systems, there are logs and messages that are important to administrators to be able to have access to in order to troubleshoot issues. Instead of having the administrator manually access the individual logs that are located on each individual service, we can consolidate all of those logs back to a central database. One of those protocols that allow us to consolidate these log files is called syslog. This is a very common standard. And if your system collects logs, then it probably has the option to send those logs to a centralized database using syslog. In many organizations, we use a security information or an event manager to collect all these log files. It can take a lot of room, so the SIEM usually needs a lot of disk space to store all these log files for a long period of time. Many organizations will have one or many different web servers, and those servers are responsible for responding to browsers' requests that would make your computer available to the web server. These are standard protocols such as HTTP, HTTPS, and they build pages out of specialized languages like HTML, HTML5. These pages could be static and simply transfer across the network, or the web server may be responsible for dynamically creating the page and then sending the page down to the browser. In an enterprise, we may often start our day by logging onto our local computer, or we may be connecting from a VPN with username and password to provide authentication. Often, the authentication that we send between all those different devices is identical. So how often does the enterprise use the same authentication method across all of these different servers? In most cases, the organization using an authentication server, which centralizes all the usernames and passwords to a single service. This isn't something we would commonly see on the home network because we don't always have the same username and password for every single device in our home. But on an enterprise network, it's very ideal. Your mail client probably has a separate folder already configured inside of it called spam. That spam folder takes any messages which may be unsolicited attempts at getting your attention and put all those messages into a spam folder that's so you don't have to read them. The content of these spam messages can vary widely. These could be commercial attempts to get you to buy something. It might be someone trying to get you to click on a link to send you to a malicious website. Or it might be some phishing attempt where someone tries to steal your username. Managing all these spam messages can be complex and a burden to administrators. It's already difficult to identify spam messages, and then we also have to manage which ones could be identified. There are security concerns all the time. We have to think about where we're going to store information and how long we're going to keep these spam messages in the database. Some organizations will have to separate the mail gateway in their network. We can see mail being sent and received from the internet through a firewall and sends it to the mail gateway on a subnet.
These mail gateways can be stored in the cloud, or they may be a third-party third provider allowing this functionality. Once the mail is scanned, it, it's analyzed and could be allowed on the local network. This gives us opportunity to categorize the spam, reject it, or prevent it from gaining access into your network. Many organizations have begun consolidating many of their security functions on the network to a single device. Often this is the next generation firewall, but you may find older systems that can do this called a unified threat management device or a UTM. Some people often refer to this as a web security gateway. These devices can perform many different security functions. For example, you have URL filtering, content inspection, you may be able to identify malware transferring between files in real time. This could be a spam filter. This could be a networking feature like a CSU, a DSU capabilities, or it could inside a wide area network. These devices often act as routers and you may see switches and interfaces on the back of these devices. And of course they allow you to use a firewall. You can allow or disallow traffic through a network. You can monitor intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevent prevention systems. You can block known attacks traversing on a network. These devices can also act as bandwidth shapers and quality of service devices so that different applications can be prioritized in real time. And if you need people to connect to the, on the network that are outside of your facility, it can also allow encrypted tunnels to facilitate a virtual private network. In an enterprise environment, we're very sensitive to downtime. If a server becomes unavailable, this user may not be able to complete certain tasks or they may not be able to buy anything from us because the server is not responding. To be able to provide continuous uptime and availability, we need multiple servers. And the way that you would distribute the load access, those servers is with a load balancer. The load balancer is responsible for checking in with all of the servers that are connected to it. And if one particular server becomes unresponsive or unavailable, it simply removes that server from the load and continues operating like normal. This is usually the primary reason that we would use a load balancer and monitor multiple servers to distribute a load. Since the load balancer is sitting in the middle of these conversations, it can also make changes to the way certain protocols might work. For example, it might offload TCP in different ways to burden different loads on the network. This load balancer may also provide SSL offloading in different encryption features. So all the encryption and decryption from these servers is happening on the load balancer instead of having the servers manage the process themselves. These load balancers are quite commonly known to cache information across the network so that requests may not slow down the users and provide congestion. Instead, load balancers may already have information cached and available on the network. So if there's a common website or a file that people access frequently, it, it doesn't have to send requests all the time to that network. We can also perform some very advanced configurations for traffic going to these load balancers. We might configure certain web pages or certain applications to have priority over others. We might also tell the load balancer that certain applications should prioritize to certain servers of other applications or web pages. The content switching capability allows load balancers to optimize communications and have them respond best on the network. Some organizations have installed proxy servers to add additional security to their internet communications. As the name implies, a proxy sits in the middle of the conversation. Users will make a request to the proxy and then the proxy server makes request to that third party service, receives a response and then continues with the forwarded request. Once everything is checked and everything looks okay, that response is sent to the end user. This means that we can put a lot of security controls into a proxy server or a proxy service. Proxy can act as an access control. 
It can require a username or password to gain access. It can perform caching. It can perform URL filtering and many other security services. If you work in industrial environments, you're probably already familiar with SCADA or ICS. This stands for the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. You might also hear this referred to as Industrial Control System or ITS. The SCADA systems are responsible for control and management of these industrial machines. So if you're part of a power company and you have power generation equipment or you're manufacturing equipment with these large manufacturing tools, you might use some SCADA systems to be able to manage these devices. SCADA allows you to see exactly what's going on and be able to manage these in real time. As you can imagine, the power generating systems and manufacturing equipment are very expensive. Outages of these systems have a dramatic impact on business. For those reasons, SCADA systems are usually segmented from the rest of the network, and you often see that they need additional rights, permissions, and connections to even gain access to these systems. One common theme is a data center with a service installed. It's very common to see this, and it's difficult to get this sort of service removed from a data center. It, also, it usually means that the device sits in the data center for a long time, 10 years or even more. So it's very important that we learn to troubleshoot and support these legacy systems. Speaking of legacy systems, you're going to come across many different types of hardware and it's not too strange for organizations to have systems that are critical and cannot be removed. Le legacy systems are found in all kinds of different organizations. You absolutely need to find ways to support them and maintain their operability. Some embedded systems are built in a data center and cannot be removed. You usually will not have direct access to it and you have to be on site. Some common systems to see like this are alarms, security systems, or even time cards. One of the newest systems that are available are the Internet of Things, the devices and how they interact with us. We're starting to find a number of increasing I IoT devices, not only for enterprise networks, but at home as well. It seems that everything we're connecting to with a power plug in our home is an IoT device. For example, we're starting to see appliances such as refrigerators and even WAPs on the IoT of things. We have smart devices that can use voice commands. We have control systems with temperatures that control the room in our halls. We have all kinds of centralized apps and mobile devices. These all talk on the network and these are all IoT devices that we can manage and function from outside the network. We could unlock a door or a garage and this changes how we view security and it's quite important how we gain access to these consoles. Okay, and we are at the end of objective 2.4. Here is a pop quiz. Proxy servers do not, it's a not question, be careful, do not bypass a firewall, do not authenticate, do not forward traffic to another server, or do not work exclusively in a Windows environment. And the answer is D. No, it does not work exclusively in Windows. You can use it for pretty much any kind of device. Here are some examples of Mac OS X, and you can see also a shell from Ubuntu configuring different sort of proxy servers. Thanks for watching.